but I mean those who are committed people and come early and on time we are planning to start earlier okay so uh, every Wednesday maybe we'll start at 650 or maybe 655 so with the prayer and the songs and everything we start the talk by 710 at the most so because every time in the past we've been running late and the book of Isaiah is really long so it will take forever if we don't do that okay so this five seven ten minutes will make a huge difference okay so we start as every time with a quiz you ready let me see the prize we've got uh, some good stuff for you more books and still goodies stuff like this okay so if you prepared we told you that we're going to cover chapter seven eight and nine so what do you think can you fill in the space here for to us a child is born to us don't look son okay good a son is born do you know where <laughs> you get a second prize if you know where the chapter huh no no just the chapters we're covering Isaiah 9 okay come Sherry choose a book from those just one <laughs> okay you will still have more chances because when we tell you to prepare in advance you know we really mean it and the reason why we do that because we have to go a little bit fast so in case you you've got a question or anything that you be ready for that. Okay, so before we go into chapter 7, or actually chapter 7, 8, and 9, the title for them is Emmanuel, God is with us. And Isaiah introduced that in these three chapters. Uh, if I give you a little history, you know that Isaiah was covering the period of five kings. Um, we saw him crying or mourning the death of King Uzziah and then the son of Uzziah came Jotham who reigned over like about 16 years Uzziah reigned around how many years 52 years he was the longest and then uh, Jotham was just 16 years and then his son is Ahaz that's the one that we're going to talk about now so during the time of Ahaz he wasn't a good person he has he did the evil in the eyes of the Lord and this history you can find in the uh, second uh, uh, Chronicles um, uh, you will find like the history and what he did and all of this basically he has never had a relationship with God okay when do you know that faith is important or, or when do you know that the faith is real when huh? when it's tested when a trial or a problem came do you remember Hezekiah the king actually is during the time of, of Isaiah Hezekiah when uh, when when the army came against him and he prayed and he humbled himself before the Lord and the Lord delivered him in just a, a huge miracle this king he has wasn't as good he heard that Syria and Israel so he has is the king of we're talking about Jerusalem so he's the king of the Jews or you know Jerusalem or Judea or Jacob Judah whatever you want to call them but the northern kingdom the bad people is Israel Okay, so Israel combined with the Syrians and they're coming to fight who? Judah. They're combining together and coming to fight him. So, what did he do? He went and asked the help of the king of Assyria. Assyria or Babylon is the same place. Many kingdoms came in this. And these were the strongest like the strongest kingdom in the world before Christ were these two the Egyptians and the Assyrians okay 
or, or the Babylonian. Assyrians and Babylonian are the same name. One in Iraq and one in Egypt. Egyptian and Assyrians. And usually you, like, you become a friend of one and an enemy of the other. If you're a friend of Assyria, then you're the enemy of Egypt. And you're a friend of Egypt, then you're the enemy of Assyria. So anyways, he has, when he heard like, that the, the, the king of Syria and Israel are coming to fight him, he cried to the king of Assyria and he said, you are my father. And he actually took all the precious uh, uh, things in the temple and he gave it to him as a gift, which are sacred things for the Lord and you should never leave the temple. But he was an evil person. He would sacrifice God in a second to get the strength of anyone else. So basically he went to the king of Assyria and told him, you're my father, come and help me. So tribulation show exactly who is my God and where is my trust. God did not leave him. God tried to approach the king he has, even though he was so bad. And he was, I hate to say this word, but he was hopeless. God never lost hope in him. And God really tried with him. And as we're going to see here. And Isaiah presented him, Jesus, as Emmanuel, the Savior. God is with us. He was trying to tell him, don't be afraid. God is with us. God is going to show you great miracles. Same thing he showed to his son or grandson, Hezekiah. That God can deliver you regardless who these people are. He can do miraculous. He can do things beyond your imagination. Just trust in him. Just ask him. Okay? So this is the background. So when we read, we understand what we're talking about. So now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Syria, Pekah, the son of Ramalia, king of Israel, these two kings, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told to the house of David, saying, Syria forces are deployed in Ephraim, so his heart and the heart of his people were moved as trees of the woods are moved with the wind. Basically, these two kings were coming to fight him, and they wanted actually to put king instead of, of Ahaz. So he was like his heart melted. The amount of fear that passes through our heart is also measured with the amount of faith and trust. How much fear comes to our heart? And I'm talking about normal fear. I'm not talking about, you know, there is some kind of fear. I don't know if you know that or not. There is some kind of fear that's psychological, that's not a spiritual. For example, someone hates mice, okay? So he can fight a lion, but he's afraid of a mice, for example. That's for real. What I'm telling you is for real, you know? Why? Because maybe when he was a kid, you know, there is a mice came and he bit him or something like this. And that's for real also. I don't know if you know that or not, but mice can, can bite someone who's asleep. Um, I want to tell you, it happened before with a bishop, you know, he's like uh, nails, like had something weird. And he said, just a mice <laughs> bit me. Okay, so they do bite. So he can fight a lion, but he's afraid of a mice. That's... I'm not afraid of these noises. <laughs> that's, something, that's something different. Okay, that's psychological. Or some kind of sickness fear that's called, you know, an anxiety or an anxiety attacks or things like this. This is kind of sickness rather than this is a spiritual warfare. Okay, but we're talking about the fear that comes because of the lack of faith. Okay, how much fear? So he said like their fear was unbelievable. It's like trees with the wind that really went down like this. <clears throat> then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz. 
you and Shear Jashub, your son. His, his, his first son is called Shear Jashub. And, and the reason why I'm saying that because he's got another son who's got a weirder name. Okay? So that's the first one. And the meaning of this son is the remnant will come back. The remnant will come back. There is hope. People will not be destroyed. Some people will stay here. Even if they're destroyed, the remnant will come back. Shir Jashob. Take, take your son Shir Jashob at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. That's where the king was. Basically, this place is where the water comes to the city, Jerusalem. Basically, the, the, the king was checking and inspecting the water so nobody can shut down the water from the city because the, the, the army will come around the city of Jerusalem. So God told Isaiah, go and meet Ehaz and say to him, take heed and be quiet. Do not be afraid or be faint-hearted for these two stubs of smoking firebrands. Don't be do not fear or be faint-hearted for these two stops of smoking firebrands. What is the two, two stops of smoking firebrands? What are they? The two nations or the two kings. Very good. Basically, even though he's an evil king and he went to ask the enemies of God to come and be friends with him, God said, let me comfort him. Let me tell him that I'm giving you something to take your fear away. Like, I care for you. Do not be afraid, because these two kings, in my eyes, in your eyes, there are two lions coming to devour you. But in my eyes, there are two stops of, of, of smoking firebrands. Meaning, you know what it means? It means, do you know this, this uh, like the candle, when you blow it out, what does it come out of it? Smoke. And the smoke, if it doesn't bring out smoke, it means it's not quenched 100%. It means it can come up again. You know these candles that you blow it and then you know, they come back to life? Because they, they never bring smoke. When you blow it out, the smoke is a symbol that it is gone. So God said, these are no, they're not two fires to come consume you. In my eyes, they're just stops of smoke, of firebrands. They're nothing in my eyes. They're dead. That's actually what the devil usually tries to do in our lives, to scare us. That's why the, the Bible before said, because the devil, your enemy, is roaring like or is coming like a roaring lion. Is he a roaring lion? No. He is like a lion. Are these two fires? No. They're like a fire. But they're quenched. They have no power. Because he is in a charge. He has never asked for God's help. Because sometimes we think that at the, at the time of tribulation, God disappears. Actually, God is the one who's going after the king to seek him and tell him, don't be afraid. I have peace and power for you. Just listen to me. Just take my power. Don't ask for anyone's power. I'm here. Even if you lost the way, even if you don't know that there is God that you should cry to. Who, who did something like this? Jonah, remember? When everybody was like seeking his God, and, and he was in another world. So a person came to him and I said, Why aren't you praying? Why aren't you seeking your God? Where is your God? Seek your God. Even though it came from a person who really doesn't know Jonah or his God. So a lot of time God sends us these reminders. Sometimes we become stubborn. And unfortunately it comes from the people who are closest to us. Why aren't you praying about this? I know what I'm doing. You don't tell me what to do. We usually say that, right? But it is a message from God. Why are you afraid? Why do you, leave, why do you lose hope? Why you're seeking someone else's help 
God is there. The enemy is not real, but it is like a roaring lion. And for the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria, and the son of Ramalia, the two kings, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Ramalia have plotted evil against you, saying, God is telling him what I know exactly. Let us go up against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves, and set a king over them, the son of Tabel. That's actually someone that they wanted to put him a king instead of Ahaz. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. What is God saying to him? Their plot is not, is not going to, it's not happening. Have you ever gotten a promise like this from God? It's not happening. What they're about to do, you are not going to be destroyed. Maybe you're going to be hit a little bit, and that's exactly what happened to Ahaz. He was hit a little bit, and the country was hit, but he was never destroyed, and he never lost his kingdom. There's a very nice verse in Lamentation that says, <clears throat> here it is. I love this verse. You can take a note of it if you like. Who is he? who speaks and it comes to pass when the Lord has not commanded it. Who is he who speaks and it comes to pass when the Lord has not commanded it? If the Lord didn't say it will happen, it will never happen. It doesn't matter if I have a million soldiers outside. That's exactly what happened with his grandson, Hezekiah the king, when the king of Sin Harib, he came and was 180,000 soldiers around Jerusalem, and God sent an angel and he killed all of them in one night without any fights, without any war. Can God do it? Yes. Who is he who speaks and it comes to pass when the Lord has not commanded it? That's faith. And he talks again and says, For the head of Syria, God is still saying. He said, It shall not come to pass. And then he says, For the head of Syria is Damascus. He's trying to say, These are their borders, and they're never going to exceed their borders. The head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken so that it will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Ramalia, the Ramalia's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. That's... God basically is trying to tell him, you know, I'm telling you a word. And it's up to you. Either you believe it or you don't believe it. It's really up to you. But if you don't believe, you will, not, you will never be solid. You will never stand in the day of tribulation. You will never stand against the enemy. You will never have like a stable and, and a solid heart. You will be moved easily. Basically, what is God trying to say is, maybe the, the, the enemy will win, and that's actually where we lose hope. For example, when the two kings came, they took over one city. They never took over Jerusalem, the biggest. But they took over a city. And that's when he, like, his heart, like, melted completely. God is saying, who cares? Even though they took over one city, they will never take the rest. And actually God brought back this city that they took over. But if you believe, you will see. Usually we hear the statement, seeing is believing. We believe exactly the opposite. Believing is seeing. When you believe what God is saying, that you will start to see God's miracles. 
and how God is working through different things. Actually, in one of the translations, it came, if you will not believe, surely you shall not be able to see. So it's exactly believing is seeing, not vice versa. When I believe, I see things that people are not seeing. And I see God's hands in things. And I see that God is more powerful than anyone else. That's called faith. And in the book of Ephesians, St. Paul said, when you are fought by the devil, you put on the whole armor of God. And one of the whole armor of God is the shield of faith. Above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. What is the shield of faith? Basically, St. Paul is saying, when there is fight against you, make sure that you hold this shield of faith. Because the, 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 the devil is throwing you with fiery darts. You know fiery darts? You know how they used to do that? Is they take the dart, okay, and they dip it in asphalt. And then they burn it, okay? So it's a flame of fire. And they throw it on someone. So even if it didn't kill him, what's going to happen? It's going to burn him. Because asphalt is like one of the things that's very, very hard to quench when it's, uh, when it's on fire. So you take the fiery dart, leave it in asphalt, the dart, leave it in asphalt, fill it with fire, and throw people with it. This is the worst thing. And he said, protect yourself with the shield of... You know what's the shield of faith? This thing that they use, you know, to, you know, to carry it in their hand and, you know, to move it with their hand left and right so the darts would just come in it and then fall on the ground. The devil is, 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 is throwing us with these fiery darts all the time. But who is carrying the shield of faith to put down these fiery darts? What is the shield of faith? What is it that we should carry in our hands? So when he throws me in something, I have something to defend. Basically, main things that we should believe in. That God is good. God is good. Yani, God is good. God is good means God never does anything evil. Okay? God is not the author of evil. Anything that God does is good. Nothing. He never creates or made anything bad. Number two, not only that God is good, but God is loving. Or he is the lover of mankind. Or personally, that God loves me. Number one, God is good. And number two, God loves me. And I forgot to say that like the first one is God is there. God is living. Our God is a living God. He exists. Because the devil tried to fight you telling you that God doesn't exist. So no, I've seen God before. I've experienced God before. God is there. Okay, God exists, but he's not good. Like he wants to harm you. No, God never does that. God is good. So God exists, God is good. Okay, God is good to all people, but he's not good to you. No, God is there, God is good, and he is good to me. Personally. So, this is how we fight, believing that we are children. He is there, that he's our God. Without this shield of faith, we will be moved easily. And God actually is trying to help us to be strengthened in our faith. He is the one who is running after he has the king in order to believe that God is there. You want to know what God even did more? Because sometimes you think that God wants to test your faith. He's giving you something really challenging and something that's very hard to believe and you want to believe that. No, believe me not. See what God is doing to, to Ahaz right after that in, in verse 10. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask, ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask nor I test the Lord. You see what happens here? What happened? God is telling Ahaz, okay, I know that your faith is weak. How about I'm going to strengthen your faith? 
Ask anything above or down. Ask any miracle in the world. I will do it for you, so you may believe. Of course, you say, how come God doesn't ask me this, you know, this? But I'll tell you later on why. He said, ask anything. Ask a sign. Tell me to bring fire from, from heaven to earth and I will do it. What did he has say, say, said? What did he say? No. I will not ask. I will not test the Lord. He's answering a spiritual answer. You know, it's exactly like God is telling you, I want to bless your life and I have a plan for your life. And you say, no, I'm not good enough. Thank you. I know that I'm humble. I'm, I'm bad. It's okay. Ask. Do you think that he was a spiritual and he didn't want to test God? Because sometimes you say, I want to ask God for a sign. And I tell you, don't ask for a sign. You're testing God. Right? But now God is the one who's telling him, ask for a sign. Why didn't he ask? Hmm. Hmm? He didn't believe, but you know, maybe if he asks for something and it happens, it's either to, you know, make his face stronger or weaker and you know make him decide. Yes. He said that there will be an obligation or, or a relationship after that. It's very good. It's 90% of the answer, so I will give you a prize. <clears throat> um, any more? Anyone tell us the 10% and take a prize? Huh? Why you didn't ask? Because this is something very important. Because if he asks, okay, for a sign, and it happens, what is he going to do? He has to call the king of Assyria and tell him, don't come. Right? And he has to wait for God to fulfill what, he's, what he said. And he said, I don't want to trust in God anymore. I'd rather trust in the king of Assyria rather than trusting God, even if God is true. Why do I have to put my trust in him again? No. I know King of Assyria. He said he's going to do it. I already committed with this man. That's it. I can trust only in what I see. And that was bad. Basically, he said no to God. I, you know, I, I don't want anything to do with you. A lot of times we do the same. Ask me. Try. But the problem is, I don't want to ask and be more committed. And my faith is a challenge and things like this. And I don't want to wait. And I don't know when God is coming. And you know, sometimes I understand God and sometimes I don't understand God. Things like this. Why God is doing that with, with Ehaz? And Gideon in the Old Testament ask for a sign and he's not doing that with us. Basically, these people are leaders. And when this man, his faith is gone, the entire people, they're gone and they're following him. So God is, is, is even is doing the extra mile going towards this man because he's, he's, there is a lot of followers for him after that. Doesn't mean that my faith is is, is uh, is not important. It is important. And, and God is trying the same way. The principle applies to us. The same way God is trying to strengthen the faith of Ahaz. Same way he's trying with us. But do we want to believe or not? He didn't want to believe. He didn't want to bother. And that was the real problem. So he didn't want to ask for a sign. Then see what God is going to do. Then he said... Hear now, O house of David. Now God left Ahaz. He said, you got, you're, you're useless. Let me talk to the rest of the people. Hear now, O house of David. It is a small thing for you to weary man, but will you weary my God also? I'm sorry, this is actually Isaiah who's talking. 
He said, you, like you're a burden to each other, you know, and you burden God with your lack of faith. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. You didn't ask for a sign? I will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and he and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Curds and honey he shall eat, he, he may know that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Basically, what God is saying is, if you don't ask for a sign, I will give you my sign. I will give you myself. I will give you my word, my perfect son. For those who believe, the best word of comfort ever is Emmanuel. God is with us. I think that's all what we need to live peacefully without any fear. If we believe in this sign, Emmanuel, God is with us. Not only that God is with us, but God is in, in us. He came to dwell in us. What are we afraid of? If God is with us, who is against us? That's what St. Paul said in Romans 8. If God is with us, who is against us? The fear will go away and the faith will come if we believe in Emmanuel, that God is with us. You think that the Jews did not believe in Christ, Emmanuel? But sometimes we don't believe in that. Not only that he came and dwelt amongst us and he became a man. No, that he dwelt in us. He is the, the kingdom of heaven is within you. He wants to dwell in you. He is so near. He is there. Do you believe that or not? God is giving himself a sign. Emmanuel, God is with us. Curds and honey he shall eat, meaning that he's not only God, but he's a full man also. He's eating and drinking. That he may choose to refuse the evil from the good that he is growing like any human being choosing the good from the evil doing God's perfect will and then he gives actually a sign here or a, a prophecy for before the child shall know to refuse this is actually a second child that will be born for Isaiah and we, we will hear his name in a little bit. For before the child, your child, the second child, shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. The Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house, they that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. And actually he... Uh, continues after that and he said it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will whistle for the fly that's in the, in the farthest part of the rivers of Egypt like God will whistle and then the flies of Egypt will come what are the flies of Egypt? the horses and the aeroplanes and all of this it's like the army will come for the bee that is in the land of Assyria so the flies of Egypt will meet the bees of Assyria, where? In Jerusalem. And they fight each other. So basically the biggest kingdoms, they will fight in Jerusalem and destroy her. He asked for the king of Assyria, but he didn't know that the king of Assyria has a huge enemy, which is Egypt. And they will come, the Egyptians, and fight the Assyrians and kill Jerusalem. And there will be a great destruction over there. Okay? And that takes us to chapter 8. Moreover, the Lord said to me, Take a large scroll and write on it with a man's pen concerning Mahir Shalal Hash Baz. Okay? That's the name of his second son. His first son was called Shair, Jashub, okay, which means the remnant will come. This is his second son. What is his name? Mahir, Shalal, Hash, Baz. That's one name. And what is it? what's the meaning of that? Speed the spoil. Come speedily and take the spoil. Hasten the booty. Like hasten to, like to, to destroy and take everything. 
come quickly and destroy basically that's what it is mahir shalal hash baz that's in hebrew of course okay but the name has no translation okay so it's the same name and i will take and i will take for myself faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of uh, Jebarashia that means people will witness on this scroll and he's going to write the name of his son then I went to the prophetess his wife and she conceived and bore a son then the Lord said to me call his name Mahir Shalal Hajbaz for before the child shall have knowledge to cry my father or my mother the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be taken away before the king of Assyria he has called the king of Assyria he came and he destroyed as he wanted he destroyed the two kingdoms of Syria and, and, and Israel you know what happened now who called them who called the king of Assyria he has did they come yes so what he depended on happened or not it did happen meaning he had an evil plan and it succeeded for a while it did what he wanted but later on it will bring so much problems and so much curse on him because like the sometimes the 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 bait or sometimes the trap work for a little bit sometimes the evil win in the beginning for a little bit but it will never win forever it will never continue to win darkness will never continue to reign that will never be the case <clears throat> the Lord also spoke to me again saying inasmuch as these people will refuse the waters of Shiloh that flow softly and rejoice in Razin and in Ramalia's son now therefore behold the Lord bring up over them the waters of the river strong and mighty the king of Assyria and all his glory he will go up over all his channels and go over all his banks he will pass through Judah he will overflow and pass over he will reach up to the neck and the, the, and, and the stretching out of his wings will fill the breadth of your land O Emmanuel king of Assyria came destroyed his enemies but later on king of Assyria in Iraq where the river called Euphrates and that's called the river in that in, uh, in verse um, <clears throat> in verse 7 the river strong and mighty the king of Assyria and all his glory he will go up over all his channels and go over all his banks he will pass through Judah Yani after destroying the enemies he will come and destroy Judah and destroy Ahaz and destroy Jerusalem basically God said people refused my water and that's called the Shiloh water if you uh, notice uh, in here the God spoke to me and saying in as much as these people refuse the waters of Shiloh that flow softly it's called like the quiet water and it represents like the Holy Spirit that's filling the church they refused me who works softly who works quietly they refused my work that is quietly and remember in, in Psalm 22 it says he leads me beside quiet waters or, or, or still waters so this soft water that comes to Shiloh which actually it's a holy water in Jerusalem and represents God's presence they refused that and they wanted a river good for them the river come but the river will destroy them but 
Is he going to destroy them completely? No. Only up till there? Up to there? Huh? The neck. What does that mean? That they're not going to drown. Only the head will remain. That's the remnant. These are the people that will not destroy it in Israel. Because Christ, the head of the church, is going to come from these people. So actually, the, the kingdom of David will not destroy it. King will come after king. So even though he will destroy Jerusalem, but there is the head of, of, of the people will stay there because it's the land of Emmanuel. God is with us. God is there and God is leading And then he says, Be shattered, O you peoples, and be broken in pieces. Give ear, all you far countries. Give yourself. Gird yourselves, but be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, but be broken in pieces. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak the word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. Basically, God is saying, do whatever you want to do. But only what I say will happen. Nothing in this universe will happen without God saying, what shall go? No country will overcome another country without God's approval first. Without, without God allowing us. For God is with us. That's the key verse. This is the key word in these three chapters. God is with us. What kingdoms here that he's talking about? I want to tell you something. It's amazing. When the New Testament church came, what, what were the empires or the strong countries back then? Hmm. Who were they? Hmm? What is the strongest? Hmm? Roman Empire, very good. Second, second and third, whatever. Huh? The Greeks. Or if we're biased a little bit, we'll say the Egyptians. So basically, the Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians. These were three great empires back then. The pyramids of Egypt, the wisdom of the Greeks and the strength of the Roman Empire. I want to tell you, the Roman Empire was ten times more powerful than America right now. It had like, it was very advanced in law, it was very advanced in power, it was very advanced in everything. They were like way ahead the rest of the world. And of course, Egyptians thought that they are the smartest and the Greeks thought that they are the wisest. But these three Christianity came and overtaken the three of them without a sword, without one war. Isn't that amazing? Can anyone believe that the Roman Empire will be gone with its strength? And even Rome, the center, will be a center of Christianity? Can anyone believe that Alexandria is the, the capital of Egypt, the biggest country with its idols and its wisdom and its will become like the school of Alexandria and will become a, 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 a lighthouse for Christianity? Can anyone believe that the Greeks with all their wisdoms will be nothing and Christianity will take over? And Greece now is like a, is a Christian country? Who can believe that? That's the power of God. He said, countries, gird yourself, but be broken, in, be broken in pieces. But God worked that through rivers, through wars, through armies, or through quiet waters. The quiet waters of Shiloh. What is the quiet water of Shiloh? The Holy Spirit that transformed the entire world. That's how God works, in a quiet way, and going, you know, in all directions, taking the entire world. 
God is with us, Emmanuel. He will take over. That's when we get down, we should, we should think of that and believe in that. The key here is in verse, verse 13, which says, The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow. Let him be your fear, and let him be your, your dread. He will be a sanctuary. He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of fence to both the house of Israel, as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Emmanuel, God is with us only when you fear him. When you put him first. You can definitely say Emmanuel with all its strength. When you say he is number one in my life. Then you say it with all your heart. And comfortably. That God is with us. You know why we can't say this word God is with us? Because I'm afraid. Because I, I know that I'm not honoring God as I should. That's what makes me hesitant to say it. Even though he's there, but I can't believe. Why? Because there is something in me that does not hallow God, that doesn't make him first. Okay? And then the very famous verse of 18, Here I am, that Isaiah saying, And the children whom the Lord has given me, the people who believed in God, we are for signs and wonders in Israel, from the Lord of hosts who dwell in Mount Zion. And in the end of the chapter, the darkness will rule over Israel. Then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be driven into darkness. Basically, only us believe in God, but all these people are driven in darkness. Will God leave the world without anything? No, the help will come in chapter 9 as a solution. Chapter 8 ends with darkness, but chapter 9 starts with light, with hope. As I, as I told you, the, the book of Isaiah, rebuke and then encouragement. Rebuke and encouragement. So that was the rebuke and encouragement is coming here. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterwards more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The gloom will not overtake the entire land. Basically, the, 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 this part that he's, he's talking about is called Galilee. You know where Galilee is? North of Israel. On the sea, right on the sea. That's why he said here, in Galilee of the Gentiles or the way of the sea. Okay? North and towards the Mediterranean Sea. And that's called Galilee or Galilee of the Gentiles. Because Israel was living with Gentiles. They mixed there. And that's actually the Samaritans. People, uh, sorry, I'm sorry. Samaritans are, are, are like south of that. But these were Jews living, but living with Gentiles. And they used to be low-class people. Low-class in everything. In standards, in wisdom, in learning, in understanding, in spirituality, in everything. They were Jews, they were Israelites, but they were low in everything. That's why when Jesus came from Galilee, he said, is anything good can come from Galilee? Like these are, they're low in everything. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. The same verse here is quoted, right? In the book of Matthew. Exactly the same words here. When Jesus came and preached in the land of Galilee. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoiced when they divide the spoil. Like God is, is bringing a lot of joy. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor in the day of Midian, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle 
and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and for fuel of fire. Basically, God will bring joy and peace. Those who use things for, for wars, they will use it for peace later on. How? How this is going to happen? Here is the answer. For unto us a child is born. And see, child, see, is capital, meaning refers to God or the Lord Jesus Christ. For unto us a child is born. Any normal child? No. Unto us a son is given. Remember, he's not, he's a son, he's a normal man. And the government will be upon his shoulder. Usually people who carry things on their shoulder, they are people who are like laborers, like cheap labor, okay? They carry things on their shoulder. Usually the kings and royal people, they carry a staff and that represents their kingdom, their government, okay? But his government is not a staff in his, is, is in his hand, it's something that he's going to carry on his shoulder which is the which is the cross amazing it's the cross he's, ca- he's going what is it that you're carrying on your shoulder it is the cross of shame his government the, re- the Lord reigned over a wood his reign is in the cross that he's going to carry on his shoulder and his, his name will be called wonderful counselor mighty God Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Ask any Jew, what is it? What is this? That someone is born and will be a normal man, but his name is Mighty God. Isn't this amazing? He is wonderful. He is a counselor. He is Mighty God. He is Everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. That's the meaning of Emmanuel. God is with us. What does it mean wonderful? Amazing. Nothing is like this. You know when, when, when Abuna was talking last Sunday. That sometimes we, we want to think that God is like someone. He's never like anyone else. He's just. He's unique. He's amazing. Wonderful in his beauty. In, in, in his character and everything. He's a counselor. Meaning full of. Wisdom. Where do we need wisdom? Where do we get wisdom from? He's the counselor. And he is mighty God. Strongest ever. Do we believe in that? Do we believe that this is our Emmanuel? God is with us. At his everlasting father. Even your father and mother will die and will leave you. But he's an everlasting father. Relationship that will never ever end. And it's a father-son relationship. Even though he's a son, but now he's calling him everlasting father. Prince of peace. He is the owner of peace. He's the king of peace. He's the source of peace. No one else can we get the peace except from him, from him Emmanuel. He's the light of the world. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. No end to his kingdom and no end to his peace. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. He will reign over the house of David because Jesus came from the house of David and he was the king from the family of David and from the family of kings and he will reign. He will be the son of David and he will be Gov- like governor him, he will be have everlasting reign. Like no king will come after that. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. Can this be more clearer than this? Isn't this a gospel? Is this is this a person talking in the Old Testament seven hundred years before Christ? Who is who is that that reigned in the house of David and his reign will never end? He will be forever who but the Lord Jesus Christ himself 
the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This is a nice verse. God is doing that because of his zeal. He loves his children. He's the lover of mankind. That's why he wanted to do that. And the end of the chapter, I will just give you a note here. He will uh, talk about <clears throat> he will talk about the judgment of Jacob because of the resistance. But he will repeat this verse multiple times, saying, "For all his, uh, for all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still." God is punishing, and yet he is stretching out his hands. Hopefully, people will take hold of his hand. He's still waiting. He's standing at the door and knocking, waiting for his children to come back to him. Still standing and stretching out his hands to his people. Any question in these three chapters? Next time, if you read ahead, we're going to cover chapter 10, 11, and 12. Okay? Let's stand up for prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, I mean our Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord. You are Emmanuel. God is with us. God who loves us beyond our imagination. God who loves us regardless. God who wants to dwell in us. You're the one who's strengthening our faith, Lord. And you're the one who's running after us. You're the one who's stretching out your hands. You are there to save, Lord. You're not there to destroy. And you're not there to punish, Lord. But you want to bring back your people to you and to your bosom. Lord, we want to believe that, that you are with us. Take away, Lord, any, any disbelief. Take away, Lord, anything, any, any, any fiery darts of the devil that tries to attack us and tell us that you're not a good God and you're not a loving God and you're not there for us. Give us, Lord, to be strengthened in your faith. We know, Lord, that you're sending signs every day to strengthen our faith and to tell us that you are with us. You are in, in us, Lord. We want to believe that, Lord. We want to experience that. We want to live that. We thank you. We praise you, Lord, for this message and for the book of Isaiah, Lord, that, that, that give you for us, Lord, as a counselor, as a king of peace, as, as, a, as a wonderful and a lover of mankind. We thank you. We praise you. Glorify, Lord. We ask you to hear our prayers through the intercession of our Holy Mother, St. Mary, St. Mark, and all your saints. Hear us, Lord, and pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth that is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not temptations, but deliver us from evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, from the kingdom, the power, the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may depart in peace. May the peace of God be with you all.